Hey man, it's Phil X, and you're watching Guitar Tales with Dave Cohen and Guitar Tales, Guitar Tales. Like, what else do you need, right? Guitar. We're geeks, nerds, gear, inspirations, positive vibes. Look out. You know, as far as I am concerned, that is one of the best bumpers ever. The great Phil X. He's a friend of the show. He's been on twice. And I just get a kick out of that every time because he vibes on positivity. He really does. And he was kind enough to give us uh, that little bumper uh, before. We have an amazing show tonight. Uh, we've decided here on Guitar Tales that we will never have any single Emmy Award winning guests on. We're only willing to have double emmy award-winning guest on from this point forward three oh is it three you're right 2002 scott's in the green room saying dave you dope you're getting it wrong 2002 2003 and 2005 three emmy awards for a phenomenal musician brian tarquin uh i'm gonna let scott talk about some of the great guitar players he's recorded with but we're really thrilled to have him on the show and before we pull him in, I, I want to talk a little bit about our latest sponsor. We have Protections of Iraq today. Check this out. Oh, I've been there many times. All of their food is delicious. It's made on premises. It's beautifully priced. Look at that. Look how beautiful it is. And doggy treats. I brought them back and my dog loves them. And it's a fun place to visit when you're going to asbury park like i will be this thursday check it out over there in asbury park and they're friends of the show too it's a really great place scott thanks for putting that fantastic uh, reel together for them so if we could pull you guys in I i'd love scott to talk a little bit hi everybody <laughs> i'm wearing my dr teeth shirt tonight because who doesn't love the muppets i love them. um yeah we we we, we turned down Dude, many, oh, many artists yeah. that <laughs> Many artists that only had one Emmy or two Emmys. We needed a guy that had three. Yeah, and I had to screw it up in the introduction. And really, the Oscars were last night, so we're kind of like we have this motif going on with people we do. winning awards and stuff. We've had so it. should we just jump right in? Because I yes, got so we many questions. Oh yeah. Welcome to the show, Brian. Guys. Hey man. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it, you know, it, I I have your whole Wikipedia page. I only printed. Three out of the 16 pages of your accomplishments, and holy crap. I mean, you know, it, 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 it really makes Scott and I so happy when we get people who are as accomplished as you are on the show, and, and that's really just something special. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're, we're very happy to have you. I'll, I'll throw out a couple of the names, and I'll let Scott jump in. But you've recorded with Joe Satriani, uh, Jean-Luc Ponty, um, Let's see, who else do we have here? Steve Morris, uh, Ron Bumblefoot, who will be on our show in April, will be recording with him, and the great yes. Leslie West, and there's many others. So th that just speaks volumes uh, about how in demand you are and how accomplished you are. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I guess we could start jumping in right now. Well, uh, we could talk about those three beauties in the, in the shelf behind them there. Yeah, let's start with that, Scott. You take over, Mr. Engel. So how did you, it. Brian, how did you win those? How did you win those fabulous uh, Emmys? Okay, so I started composing for all my children probably back in the 90s. That all came about because I had uh, contemporary jazz releases that were being played on the radio, and they were charting well. And uh, so they wanted to bring me in to bring kind of a... Uh, you know, more uh, better production to their music, more record production to their music. So I joined them, and uh, consequently, this is how I won the, the Emmys. Amazing. But not just once. Like, how does that happen? See, I mean, what are you doing 
each year because it's uh 2002 2003 some you know you got ripped off in 2004 as far as i'm concerned <laughs> <laughs> but then you came back in 2005 I, I, maybe many people don't notice but i actually won i just couldn't make the show yeah <laughs> i wasn't there I had I had Brian accept my award for me. <laughs> yeah, but but what are you doing that that really distinguished you? And I, I'm going to guess that no one from that show won in other years before you when you kind of raised their game a bit. Well, they did win, and, and the way it was, it was like a group of composers. There were, you know, I was part of a group of composers um, doing the music for the show. So, and then the music supervisor and the music editor. I think during that period of time, that's when they were raising the game, and they were, you know, bringing people in and and doing doing a lot lot better than they had. So, you know, I, I guess it's one of those things where it kind of goes in cycles. Where you know, some some guys, you know, have like ten of these. Okay. Really, that's amazing. I have uh, absolutely none. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have a Planet of the Apes poster. That's what I have, and and a and a fake knockoff of Eddie's guitar. That's what I have to do. I, I have I have some little league awards for my son. That's what I have. <laughs> in nineteen seventy eight I won best best musician in uh, middle school. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got none of that crap. So so what is let me what does it do to your career? I mean your your career's already great, I guess. If you're if you're you know doing television like you're doing and you're composing, you're already at a very high level. But let's talk about like 2002. You're part of a team that wins an Emmy. What happens next to your career, if anything, from that? You know, you can, you know, not a hell of a lot, but you know what? What actually you get like more doors open if you want to go in different, right, like different shows and things. But you know, it's um, it's competitive. So you know, I guess it did open. You know, uh, be able to. Or, you know, composing for shows for other shows. So, so in the composing, do you bring other musicians on board and and sort of hire guys to do stuff with you? Or do you play all the instruments? Or usually, I do everything myself. It depends you do, on yeah. Production, like if it's a if it's a, a very large production, I, I may you know I'll probably go out and maybe get some orchestral people and come in and maybe do some live instruments. Um, a lot of it is like you just do it in. And what kind of style? So, are you are you basing your composition on scripts, or is it a little more broad strokes than that? You know, sometimes it was script. Sometimes it was really more the scene than the okay. Script. So, uh, and so it could be something that's going to be you know, a tension building kind of thing. It could be also an action kind of, uh, kind right. of composition. And where does your sort of artistic satisfaction fall? You know, so let's 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 use the example. You've got a scene, right? And, and you know, there's a confrontation with a couple of protagonists, right? And, and you, you have a feel for the vibe of the scene, and you come up with just the perfect music to to help the actors. The, the actors help you, and the script helps you, and you help the actors in the script. And you and you you obviously you've got those three awards behind you, so you, you've hit it, right? How does that degree of artistic satisfaction compare to, let's say, if you were to just write an original song where everything came from inside of you that you wanted to express it? You know, wh those two experiences. Yeah, that's those are two greatly different experiences. Because the, the first, yeah. we're writing to the scene. So it also, the director, the producer, the music supervisor, everybody has to agree. Mm. Right. Sometimes you you know, you feel like this is where it should go and they don't like it, and so you have to change it into their direction, even if you don't feel that's the direction you should go in. You know, you certainly get a lot more satisfaction on doing, you know, doing the record, you know, where it's from always. You're and you're, you're in control of the whole operation, yeah. Yeah. It, it, the the it, only input is, is basically you. Right. <laughs> or your producer, unless you're producing your own stuff, which I'm pretty sure you do. It is... When you do it for the show, is that more like job satisfaction than artistic satisfaction, or maybe a little amalgam of both? Yeah, it's probably a little of both. You know, of course, you want to get it. The whole thing is about doing the right music for the scene and doing the right music. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
you know, you want to make the client happy as well. But you're wanting to make, you know, the reason you're doing it is to actually. And I'm I'm guessing the actors don't really hear the the soundtrack until the the production is finished. Yeah, so exactly. They, so they're going to be just as surprised and happy, I would think, as some of the viewers. Yeah, exactly. That's well, that's interesting. That's that's very interesting. And Dave, now, Dave, you don't know this, but I wrote this. Yeah. Dun dun dun. I, <laughs> I like that. It's a really suspenseful piece. Three. It notes. really is. <laughs> I didn't win any awards, though. So whatever. Now, now, when you when you do this, when you go through that, I would imagine to be a difficult exercise because you know you're serving a lot of masters, right? When you're writing, when you're scoring um, and recording like that, a lot going on there. Does your skill set that you really have to fine tune for that help you when you then write your own music? Because you, you know you want to emote something, and you've gotten so fucking good at it. I would think when you're writing for television and you're literally writing for a scene, right? Yeah, you know it's it's interesting because you actually wind up you know, critiquing yourself and editing yourself, even when it's not for, you know, for a scene or something, it probably helps you be able to choose, you know, you make decisions quicker okay. Okay. And, and not linger on, you know, some guys they'll linger on a, like 45 solo, you know, and, and then you have to pick that. Stuff. Mm. You know, for me, I try to get in the first couple of takes if you want you want the energy there. You want some of the improvisation. It doesn't get like the same thing, you know, you're doing over and over again. Right. Hashing it, you know, it loses some of its, uh, I don't know, its interest and its, uh, and its uh, acuteness, you know. So I think it, it actually does help you. you know? mm. I agree. I mean, I mean, you, you get some solos and they're kind of iconic solos and they're, and they're played exactly the same way every time when they're played out by certain artists, you know, but when they were in the studio coming up with that for the first time, right. they going over it and over and over, you kind of tell which solos were kind of really done over and over and over again. And which ones that kind of seem like they're a little bit off the cuff and they have, and they do have, you're right. They seem like they have more energy, even if there's a little mistake in it, you know, uh, I, I've heard, I heard a pop song the other day where I, I said, that's a mistake, but they left it in a take. And you know what? I like it. Yeah. It doesn't sound bad. It sounds good. It sounds fresh. It sounds organic. Yeah, it's not, and it also sounds like it did come off the cuff. Like that was something that he came up right there and then in the studio. Because, you know, you know, written out solos, I guess, are okay for certain things. But, you know, they get to be a little, you know, bright. Yeah. And when you're and when you're in the studio playing that, how how do you convey the energy that would even come close to you just letting loose, you know, and servicing the song in real time, right? That's that's the big thing is that you got to. I think you have to know how to rein in, rein it in, bring it for what purpose? For you, you don't want to yeah, you know, blow the whole thing and let it go just for you know small scene you know you want to kind of like hold it back and you know dramatize it and also build it up you know build you know i, I found that the artist to, to learn how to build it up so okay build up a to a crescendo you know a solo or to whatever uh it, it serves too and just kind of gives you know i think more dynamics right you know, we spend a lot of time, and, and it's funny with Scott and I, I, can, I don't remember whether we're on or off the air, because every time I talk to Scott, <laughs> it's a show. But we always, it's funny, like if we record us just talking in the car, it's a show. Uh, but we always talk about servicing the song. Yes. And, and there's, and I would think with a guest like you, where, where you're as much a composer as you are a guitar player, right? I would think just in your blood, in your veins, the way you are wired, you are always servicing the song. Whereas a lot of really good guitar players are just playing good guitar without servicing the song. Yeah. I think that's what the difference is. I think maybe guys that were in bands and stuff, they, that's what they do. They go and play, play the, the part and everything. And, 
not worried about you know the large picture of the stuff. Right. Because you know the way I do it, I'm looking at the whole picture of the song from beginning to end and also i guess that's also a producer's job mm. well, and so a lot of guys yeah. tell them that's too much not enough unless, yeah. unless you're making a jamming record you know where, where you, you, you would want joe satriani right to to go ape shit and do his thing um you would certainly wouldn't want to hold him back or john luponti on the on, on the violin or whatever it is um uh, in, in in some respect, they are servicing that song, right? Because it's a jam song, and they're expected to go yeah. hog wild on on whatever track they're 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 doing something with you on. Yeah, well, you know, when I do these, I give them a second. Go, you know, I oversee their solos. I mean, the reason I'm getting them is because of what I do right. I want them to go all out. It, it, and you know, it's we've we've talked before. Um, I've spent too much time thinking about when Eddie Van Halen was on Saturday Night Live jamming with G.E. Smith. And, oh. and that that whole thing bothers me on so many levels. <laughs> and, for, and, I'm, and I'm a big Eddie fan, right? I think the best part of that jam was when he wasn't playing lead and he was just playing that really cool riff with G.E. Smith. I think that was the most listenable part of the jam, not when he was going wild with his leads, because I feel like he was in a different time zone, than, not time zone, but a different zone than the rest of the song. But it, they, you know, they came up with this cool riff, and when those two guys were just playing the riff together, I think that's when it was the most listenable. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's it's true. They probably that was off the cuff too. They probably, he was, right. Yeah. I feel like he had to jam as many notes as he could in the time that he had to say. You know, here I am, Eddie Van Halen. I'm supposed to be this amazing virtuoso. What do you see? How many notes I shove into this song? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that don't really belong there. But you know, he's anticipating what they're expecting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. You know, and probably not just have him lay back and. Yeah, you're right. And then it's not really Eddie jamming with the band if he doesn't do that. Exactly. You're right. He, that that's the, that's a great guitar tells quote. He's anticipating what they're expecting. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Well, he was. I mean, that's the way yeah. I got it. Uh, David Letterman, too. Yes. Oh, I don't remember that one on Letterman. Yeah, Letterman. That was a good one. Actually, he was he was really actually. Oh. He sat in with the band, and I guess he played the little bumpers and stuff. Plus, I guess he did a, a song. Yeah, uh, and he, he played some old Cream stuff too. Oh yeah. Oh, did he? Oh, that's very. Because he got cool. to play whatever the band was doing with the bumpers, you know, whatever song they were covering. They, he would just jump in, and that must be, you know, fun. We could play your childhood songs that you sort of remember. Yeah. Well, I remember when they did. Um, do you remember the jam when they did "Won't Get Fold Again" yeah. with Sammy? Great that version. Was, that's my. I think that's my favorite cover of it. It's really of that good. Tune. It's a good cover. Yeah, it's on that album too. Um, mm -hmm. A live record, yeah, that's that's actually really good. They played that a lot on radio, and, and you know, I'm a Who fanatic, and they they kind of did it justice, you know, and, and, and most bands really can't. Yeah, playing all the keyboard parts and the guitar parts. I know. Only, <laughs> yeah, that's one where it's perfect for Eddie. <laughs> you know, how many people could do that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Brian's uh, record um, that he did, uh, Brothers in Arms. Yeah, what's the history of that? Well, you know, Brothers in Arms and Beyond the Warrior's Eyes, they were all done at the same time. The time I was living, I have a, a mobile studio, mobile, kind of like a Rolling Stones mobile studio. And at the time, I was living up at Woodstock, and that was over the pandemic. And so everybody was on lockdown. So I was putting this album together, and I started talking to everyone, and wound up doing 19 songs and I wanted to break it on so that the the heavy metal stuff with Joe and Vinnie Moore and all of that I I thought that should be its own album Brothers in Arms and then the more fusion stuff with Eric Johnson and Ponte and Steve Morris would be a separate release because I thought it would do the justice to both that's how the whole thing came about you know hope for the war what it so you know. I, I don't you you're a veteran too aren't you 
No, I, I actually, I did a stint in the ROTC in the 80s, but okay. I think. I saw the flag behind you, and I thought maybe you were, you were a... Uh... Dad was, uh, was a Marine in World War II. So. Okay. There you go. We were, we were smelling in a wonderful way your loyalty yeah. to the armed services, which because is you, a great you, thing. Because you donate a, a bunch of money, right? I mean, there's some proceeds that go to, um, to that effort. Um, and I have a little QR code here if you want to donate. It's called um, Hope for the Warriors. You can just click that QR code and make a donation. We appreciate that. Right, right directly to them. Yeah. That's oh, awesome. that's fantastic. That really is. Yeah. I, th I felt like giving back to them. And, you know, another thing is, is they're probably not even aware of a lot of things. People are busy. They probably are aware of what, you know, that go through coming back home. And I, I used to play. Um... The, uh, the the hospital in, in my area I, when I was with a duet and I finished singing I don't know my way or something <laughs> and it, and there were a lot a lot of the guys are in wheelchair bound stuff and they tried to start to stand up to give me a standing ovation I'm like whoa, whoa, whoa don't sit out sit out oh my god at the VA they were a terrific bunch of guys I used to do a bunch of gigs there each year totally free just go in there and uh, make them happy and they really appreciate it and it, just just really cool to talk with everybody yeah they're great it, it's really nice stuff and and you're taking all of your different musical interests and funneling them all to that one great place right mm. yeah basically you know everything you know because it's all instrumental and so you know a lot of these guys you know are guys i looked up to oh yeah and and then to give back to like the veterans is cool and, and you know and i pose them all specifically them and you know each artist and for you know that so it's no it's always a noble cause to give back like that in anything and we've had many guests on that have their own charities as do i um you know it makes you feel good and makes them feel good it feels like it's not just about music it's it feels like your music is actually physically helping somebody it is uh, it's and, that is, and, and then I would imagine that's a good driving force when you're creating this stuff that, you know, it's not just for your pocketbook. Yeah, that's that's actually, I was going to say, that's the that's the driving force for creating it because it's like you're creating a really good reason, you know. It's not just creating it, just create it. It's for a good cause. Yeah. And, and, and when you go to record that music, it, it, it just, it occurred to me as we're chatting here, that under your belt, in addition to doing, you know, the sort of pay for hire stuff that we might call it for um, television, your, your your passion work, your literally your passion work. You said two things. You said fusion and heavy metal, and yeah. and, and and they're they're obviously related, but they're they're also kind of different. And you know, is one of the two a little more near and dear to your heart? Do you just have an equal love of both of those styles? You know, when you look at heavy metal, heavy metal is almost like fusion in the sense that, you know, you you, you got real players, really good players, right? You have improvisation, you know, jazz and metal they they're not that far apart in that sense. You know, musically, of course, you know they are, but but uh, you know, I always you know I always loved you know I came from rock and roll, came from British invasion, all of that, so you know that really right. And really, if you think about it, if you think of some of the older British, I mean, think about Jeff Beck. Yeah. He he is he's heavy metal and he's fusion mm -hmm. wrapped up in one guy. That's exactly it. Yeah, and that and that was what's so cool about him because you can see the whole evolution back in his career. Yeah, it, it was you know, like, you know the Yardbirds and then his group and you know Zeppelin based. You know, Jimmy paid Bay Zeppelin all on, on Jeff Beck's, you know, albums that did so well. Because it was like hard rock blues, you know. Yeah, and, and that was my next question. Is, is Led Zeppelin heavy metal? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, you know. Is it heavy metal? Is it not? He never had the tone that that metal did. Right. But songs, you know, definitely, you know, I think, open that genre you know was it was you know there's some songs that were really heavy for them even even though he may not be his guitar rhythm is as heavy as say like you know tony iomi or somebody but it, it still i think evokes the same sense 
sort of really drove that, drove the bus there, you know, making right. it that little heavy, heavy beat. Same way, you know, Richie Blackmore was never that overdriven of guitar as far as the tone goes, but it was John Lord that had that rhythm of distortion in his organ through the uh, Marshall that really drove. And those are, and, and it's it's almost like um, you know the, those two things that were together. Then they took slightly different paths as they moved on. When you think about fusion, you know, and heavy metal, because they they were you're right at the era that you're talking about, they were kind of married to some extent. They were, they were, and if you like look at early Mahavishnu Orchestra stuff, that's like that's like metal, you know, meets. <laughs> You know, LSD. I mean, it was <laughs> literally, well, literally. <laughs> I had a chance to meet Billy Cobham years ago when he was playing a triple snare, triple bass drum kit, with all the stands moved out of the way, so he can. They had had developed this thing where he can just swivel his chair and hit all the pedals. I was like floored. It was it was a really cool moment to see him play that thing. He's one hell of a drummer. I tell you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got uh, upstairs. I've got a Billy Cobham vinyl. <laughs> I do. I don't know. I don't even know if I've listened to it too many times, but I do own one. All right, you're gonna have to put it on the wall for next week, just for me. I will Which, do it for you. What's the name of it? Which one is it? I I don't even remember. I'd have to run upstairs, but I, you know, every so often I replace the guys behind me, and um, and I was just paging through my not so impressive vinyl collection. I'm like I have a Billy Cobham record. <laughs> you know, like, it's sort of a weird thing to own, I'm a but huge for fan. you. For you, Scott, I'll put it up there. Yeah, I like the magic. I like the uh, inner conflicts. I love all that stuff. Big one with Tommy Bolin on it and Jan Hammer. I mean, that. Oh yeah, yeah. I almost blew out my speakers playing one of his CDs. I forget what the hell it was called. Warning! It says warning. If you cannot play this record loud, or it'll screw up your your stereo system. And guess what? Of course, it's because of my stereo system. <laughs> yeah, how do you not? How do you not play it loud when it says "Don't play it, it really, loud"? Yeah, absolutely. That's the yeah. first thing I was gonna do. Oh yeah. <laughs> how was that, Scott? <laughs> oh no, Brian! Don't freeze! Don't freeze! Did Brian freeze? Hopefully, he's not frozen in real life. No, he better only on the life. screen. There you go. We're getting movement again a little bit. He's getting choppy. His internet connection's good. Yeah, I think. Wait. You guys are going to make me work hard editing a show, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Let's see. We, we could see We could see you're smiling, but we can't hear you right now. Oh, here he goes. I think he's back. A little pixelated, but not too bad. There we go. My frozen? Still there? No, no. Oh, you, you unfroze. You unfroze. There he's we go. Back. He came back to life. That's right. Just like, it's alive. <laughs> like Walt Disney's frozen head. Is that That's true? Right. They froze Walt Disney's head, and they're going to thaw him out and bring him back to life someday? Do they have it really? I, <laughs> I have heard that. There we go. So there we go. Now you're now you're crystal clear again. So that's good. So the early days of Brian, what, were you in a bunch of rock bands and stuff? Were you were primarily guitar player. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. Do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Was it terrible? I remember mine. Oof. Hmm. <laughs> it was like you know. I grew up in New York City, so it was. Um, I, I originally wanted to do drums. But that yeah, we'd be in an apartment in New York City was that. Yeah. So, you know, went you know, went to guitar and uh, it was great. I started some bands. We had some high school bands, we'd play some pubs and some bars and you know, and things like that. And then I, then as I as I kind of I did write some songs, but you know, I always you know what what blew me away is when I did hear Wired for the first time and Jeff Beck with Jan Hammer. I said, that's it. That's what I want to do. Because, you know, nobody really played like that. You know, in, in, in. Oh, I love There and Back. That's one of my favorite Beck albums. Yeah. With Jan all, all those albums were just terrific. And so it was like, wow, you know, I, I something like that. Would be well, there he goes. Did oh, you get there. wired on the wall? <laughs> what are you doing? You're interrupting our guest, you crazy. He can't hear me because the interview is fine. Ugh, there we go. What are you I doing? Think... You know how hard I'm going to have to edit this show out? He was just saying yeah, something just... interesting. You wanted to get the wired record off the wall, I know. Blow by blow. Oh, blow by blow. Sorry. Sorry. Poor Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and that was by uh, 
Jeff Beadle there, George Martin. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. See, we got something good out of it, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. I always drop in nice little pictures and stuff to cover these things up. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Scott. Poor Scott. Well, you know what's interesting? Now that I said it, it won't happen. My dog isn't barking. Shoo, don't don't even bring that up. <laughs> That's good we, thing we have mostly animal lovers on the show because uh he, he ate, actually ate one of Dave's guitars during Dave Gellis's interview. Dave Dave was with blood, sweat, and tears. And oh, yeah. he, ate, he ate the knobs off his guitar. <laughs> literally in the middle. I was wondering why I had it on a guitar stand next to me, and he was shockingly well behaved. <laughs> and Dave is talking about something really interesting. And I have to admit, I was a little nervous to have Dave on. We didn't know him yet. And he's, you know, just like you, he's very accomplished. And I had to interrupt the entire show because I looked down and two of the volume uh, pot covers were just missing. And I realized my 25 pound dog had consumed them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I showed Dave and it became pretty funny because I held up Dave my guitar. Dave now calls that guitar Alpo. That's the new name of the guitar. <laughs> That's so all. All right, Scott made a clip there. That's a good one. <laughs> but yeah, he uh, he ate two volume pots on the show. Chuck wagon. Yeah, <laughs> that works. If it's a country band, that would be a good country name. <laughs> so so you start out rock and roll, right? You're playing around New York City, and then then you discover Jeff Beck, and then where did that discovery and and, and that inclination take you? Well, I kind of discovered it during my teenage years, and I was trying to get the band to do like Blue Wind or Freeway Jam, but of course, you know, we weren't that good yet. And so yeah. we had to build up to that. And then in college, you know, I started I started posing and writing, and I started saying, thinking, what? You know, they came out with, you know, that drum machine, that bass in it and everything. And then, um, you know, as I was doing that, you know, I was actually I went to audio engineering, so I went to really in you know audio production school in the city. So I was really interested in doing that and started working for studios, kind of honing, you know, kind of honing your craft and learning as you go. That's really good stuff, and, and that obviously is setting the stage to give you your great career in composition for television, and I would imagine many other mediums, right? One of the, the first jobs I got at uh, for a jingle house, like a, a big jingle house on Fifth Avenue. It, it was it was like you know I was going. Then I moved to California, and then I really got a big eye open to get a real education out there. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and when you hit the, I'm assuming L.A. Right? That's that that's heavy metal heaven out there. Whether they play it or not, they all look it out there, right? They're all in their heavy metal garb in L.A., right? Especially at the time. Yeah, this is like the very early 90s. So they still were, you know, hanging on the, uh, you know, the Sunset Strip and Zari, all of that stuff. Yeah. You know, the pay-to-play thing, the whole the whole thing. It was there. In, in and uh, But it started to die because of right then, you know the the Seattle scene broke. Yeah, it's good stuff, and and then all of that, like we, it's just bringing you to where we are today. And, and the next thing that maybe just is sort of we pull it all together. What's next for Brian Tarkin? You mean in the future? Well, it, yeah, like you know. So, what are you working on these days, and, and where will this, you know, take you? Where do you see it going? I'm working on some new tracks for a follow-up, but it, but it probably be, won't be a full album. Maybe in either an EP or I may release it as singles. I'm working with Gus G on a track, and then I'm going to um, with Al mm. Oh wow! Uh, um, a couple other guys, and so I'm to you know this is the very early stages of it. I'm also working on I have a I have a catalog my label plus television and film catalog called first choice music and so um i have a deal with apm which is owned by sony and so they represent it worldwide for all tv film placements so i'm, I'm what i'm doing now is i'm updating the uh, catalog all the time 
Mm. Oh, that's got to be a big job. Yeah, yeah. It's, I'm, I do it with uh, my dear friend Hal Lindis in Dire Straits. So we do, we kind of get together and we do, because our styles are very different. So we can kind of play off each other and compliment each other on, like, you know, some new, you know, rock or castle, you know, arrangements. Just all sorts of interesting stuff. Mm. Well, that's good stuff. And, and this is the question we ask. It, it's almost a dated question at this point, but how do people find you? Oh, well, just, you know, you could go on Spotify. You can go on uh, you know, BrianTarquin.com, BHPMusic.com, um, any of those. Well, that, and Scott is just putting them all up on the screen, making <laughs> our job easier. But this is good stuff. We want to thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, yeah, click on it. Click on it right there. I'm pointing at my screen. Oh, cool. great. Great. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. It's been yeah. great. I'm glad we got it together and you were able to get on because uh, we had some technical issues uh, tonight. But I think all in all went pretty well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we learned about the, the uh, diversion of... Uh, of uh, heavy metal infusion. That was that's a pretty cool concept. I never thought of that before. I was well, I was he was saying that. I just wanted to mention that you know John Lord's fifths on on the on the on the organ became power chords for the guitar, which were fifths, right? So Purple and Led Zeppelin and of course Sabbath. They really you know I love those guys. And in their early days, they completely paved the way to what what heavy metal would become. You know? yeah. And priest too, I love guys. They legendary, all- legendary. Yeah, and they should all be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> they let's, not go, let's not go there, but let's just. Put I that agree up. with Mr. Scott. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a lot of fun, and as it always is, you know, we're we're pushing 40, 45 minutes. It feels like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Went by fast, didn't it? Yeah, yeah it always does because it's just people talking music, so it's so much fun. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And this is Dave Cohen signing off on Guitar Tales and Scott. Yes, sir. We can uh, catch all our shows on YouTube, and we're running our catalog every Thursday, uh, Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so they'll be playing streaming across multiple platforms not just YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Instagram, and X, Twitter, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, some big guests coming up. Uh, if you, if we, and pl- past shows that are very big, doing well. I think Ace Fraley's show is up to 17,000 views now or something like that. Uh, our Van Halen specials up there. Uh, Phil X's show. Um, I know the, the Don Jameson show is doing really well, so they're all there for you to check out. And of course, Brian's will be up there as well, and uh, we'll see you soon. Of course, and every, all the audio is on um, Audible you know, streaming platforms all over the place. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, <laughs> that's all I have to. I'm done plugging. All righty. <laughs> thank, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>